Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick. I cover the Supreme Court for Slate.com, and I think I've been doing it for 15 years. I think that coverage, you know, ebbs and flows over different eras. I think that the court is not covered to today the way it was in the Warren Court era. Certainly, it's not covered the way it w was covered, you know, during uh, the Brethren era. Uh, so I think there's always going to be trends in the court. You know, I remember reading, um, I'm trying to remember whose book it was. I think Jeff Shessel's book about the, about, uh, uh, the FDR nominees and thinking, really? They got to just drink and play poker with the justices all the time? Awesome, you know, like why can't, why am I not then, you know, with a cigar and a hat? And then I realized I'd be like making cannolis in the back room. But, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting right now, the, the distance between the court and the press corps on the one hand, and the, and the real formality, I think, that exists there. And I think what's also very interesting is this sense among, and I guess I alluded to this, among the press corps that what's interesting and what's important is what happened to the law today. And you know, I've often joked, and I think it's pretty accurate, that we're in a moment right now where press coverage is pretty much confined to, um, you know, we treat the law as if it's alive and the justices as though they're dead. And so there's not a lot of interest in, you know, the day-to-day -day workings of the nine justices, much more interest in, oh my God, you know, did you see uh, what happened to the Commerce Clause today? And which is great, but uh, I think there's a, th that tends to be a pretty unitary experience. People are, and this is, I think, to their credit, this is a beat full of wonks and nerds, you know, and they cover it as wonks and nerds. And with a few exceptions, we don't get scoops. We don't really look for scoops. You know, we're not asking the clerks to talk to us because they're not going to talk to us. Uh, we're not trying to cozy up to the justices because if they give us an interview, they're not going to tell us anything other than, you know, their new book that they wrote, which we can read. So I think there is such a, a, a divide that almost all the pathways into being gossipy and, um, justice focused have been foreclosed and people have compensated I think by really becoming kind of junior law professors and so what you really see I think in the press corps and again I think it's to their credit uh, because it makes for phenomenal coverage of the court is really high level legal analysis I think that what does drop out is some of the huh, how weird that this happened or this happened or that, you know, Sotomayor talks and somebody rolls their eyes or how weird that, you know, the Chief Justice keeps telling, you know, Justice Kennedy to go ahead and ask his question. Interesting things that don't get uh, picked up, I think, because we are very, very focused on writing, I think, for, for uh, the legal community. Right. I, Justice Scalia has a, a great quote where he says, I lived in the closet, if you can imagine him living in any closet. But he said, for a long, long time, I sort of lived in the closet and didn't come out and say what I thought. And then uh, at some point, I just realized, you know, I was going to be uh, the subject of conversation, whether I was in the conversation or not. So I just made the determination to be in it. Um, and he describes it in terms of coming out of the closet. But, I, I, you know, he's talking about being in the public discourse. And I think that that tension is really ramped way up right now for the justices. I think if you look at the number of TV interviews and book sales and appearances on Sesame Street and wait, wait, don't tell me, you know, I mean, they are in the world in a way that, you know, remember when, you know, Justice Brennan like stopped giving speeches and going anywhere, you know, he went no place because he felt too vulnerable. So I think we're in a moment where, you know, and, and I think there's a mistaken tendency to ascribe that to book sales. It's not just book sales. I mean, it, it's easy to be flip and say, you know, oh, they want, they want to sell millions of books. But I don't think that's what drives this. I think there's a feeling that everybody's talking about me, so I want to be talking about me. And if people knew me, they would like me and get me. And I think that that's a perfectly natural tendency. But I, and I think, you know, it's interesting because, again, it ebbs and flows. We're in a moment where a lot of the justices feel like there's an interesting public conversation about the law and the Constitution going on, and they want to participate in it. But at the same time, you know, they go off and give speeches. They don't tell us where they're going. Uh, they, you know, write uh, uh, opinions that are so impenetrable that nobody can understand them. So I think that there is this push-pull tendency where they want to be clear and they want to be understood. They bitterly resent the press and, you know, their statements from every one of the justices across ideological lines about how we distort and misinterpret. And yet they don't make themselves clear. 
And so I think it's a real problem. You know, I think that they have a vested institutional interest in both protecting themselves and in obfuscating. And that's fine, you know, if you're gonna write a 160 page opinion, like understand someone's gotta interpret it. Uh, and then at the same time, I think there's a vested interest in not being misunderstood. And so they're caught on the horns of this tension and I think it really plays out in the relationship with the press because they hate the press, but they need the press. And that kind of weird, Patty Hearst, you know, and we're in captivity to them in the same way. I mean, I think the press both bitterly resents the distance and the obfuscation and the complexity of it, but we're sort of in love with them and hoping for access. And I think this, you know, if this were a marriage, it would be in big, big, big trouble. But because it's, you know, a relationship between an institution of government and the press corps that covers it, it's just sort of pathological. It's not, nobody's going to fix this. Nobody has an interest in fixing it. And that's, and that's, I mean, think about the ways that that plays out at the confirmation hearing, right? I mean, they will wax eloquent for three strict days on the right to privacy, but ask them about Griswold and it's over. So I think there is this tendency to um, want to talk generally, want to diffuse concern, you know, they all of them like to talk about how, oh, we're unanimous most of the time, people think, you know, we're political, we actually agree all the time. You know, there's this very, very clear institutional message, nothing to be afraid of, you know, we are not usurping any <laughs> democratically elected processes, you know, don't worry, what we do is basically trivial and we all love each other and we get along and then you know at the same time they're like oh my god you know as Ginsburg said to Katie Couric like these guys are just completely out to lunch about the way lives work so I think again it's this attempt to thread this needle in public discourse about what the court does and to sort of you know use the Justice Breyer you know nothing to be worried about the court is as fabulous an institution as it can be, and it's teamed with these really bitter, biting, angry language in dissents, you know, angry language in concurrences, attacks on one another in writing, and it's like, wh which of these two models are we supposed to believe? And I think the court still has this notion, and maybe they're right and I'm wrong, that the only people who care about what's in the opinions are the people who read opinions, and then when they go to Walmart and they throw out the first pitch, or they go on, wait, wait, don't tell me, you know, they're just brushing against you know, it's no different from seeing a Kardashian out in the world. You know, people are like, hey, justices are like you and me. And maybe they think that those two, there's no kind of um, inherent conflict between the two messages they're sending out. One, which is we ended the 2013 term really angry at each other and on issues of race and gender and religion, we could not be more divided. And then this sort of kumbaya, but weren't unanimous most of the time. And I think we got to figure out, they have to figure out which message they're giving. I just don't think the public is quite as convinced that they're sort of harmless and collegial and gravitasy as they want us to believe. I, I mean, it can, I, don't, I don't find it confusing. I think, look, the nature of all good drama is conflict. And for me, you know, I love the fact that they're trying to send out you know, look away, nothing to see here. You don't even need to be in the chamber because nothing of interest happens here. Uh, you know, and then the screaming and the hair pulling that goes on. I mean, how can I not love the tension between those two postures? Uh, I think, you know, part of my job is to explain why the court has a vested institutional interest in doing all the things it does to hamper real coverage and real scrutiny. And at the same time to say, this is what's really going on. And as is often the case in complicated situations, both those realities are true. You know, that the court is first and foremost a court. It is different from other branches in government. It's not just about the hair pulling. There is real law <laughs> happening there. And these are people and they have histories. And sometimes they get really mad and write things that are intemperate. And that's super interesting. And to try to, find a path for my readers between those two tents, the, the sort of, b between the tension between those two very distant places and to say, you know, and I think this is, uh, you know, more and more, I think this is the most interesting part of my job is that you can hold in your head those two ideas at the same time, that you can say at the same time, you know, we don't, we're not like weird when we love the court. The people who report on the court really are not 
captive and we're not pulling our punches and we're not you know blind to the reality of it we just really love this institution we believe in it we think there is nothing more awesome than reading an 85 page opinion with all the footnotes included like that is a good day and we love that because what they're doing is real and important and also by the way sometimes they act like big honking babies and they don't want us to call them out for it but Sometimes they act like big honking babies. And I think that to hold those two ideas in your head, that it's both a, a sort of purely political, ideological institution, except for when it's not, uh, is, is kind of the core mission of, for me at least, this beat. And I think you get a lot of pressure to do one or the other, right? Editors love the narrative where you're like, appointed by George Bush, you know, like that's really important, you know, that this is 5-4, liberals, conservatives, men, women, those are the narratives people love. But I think underneath that, there's this other narrative, which is also really interesting, which is this is how the law works. It's just different. It's not the way you pull the lever uh, when you go into the voting booth. And to try to marry those two narratives, I think, is kind of the most interesting part of the job. I think that there's a built-in resistance for most of us who cover the court to the way the court wants to be covered. In other words, I think that you know, the persistent message that began, you know, long ago, I mean, long before for my era, when, you know, th you would look at the transcript and the transcript said the court instead of, right, Justice Brennan, because they were all the same. They were just brains in a vat and they were all identical. You know, so there is, is a, a, a deep institutional history of making it very difficult to tell the personal story. Um, and I think most of us, even though we're, as I said, I think very, very interested in the law story, would love to have interviews, would love to have access, would love to play poker with the justices and know the backstory. And so I think there, there is a feeling of being um, locked out. Um, and I so I think that that breeds a certain uh, sense of that's the immediate that's the immediate fight. But I, I guess what's interesting to me is that the choice has been made to, instead of doing a whole bunch of gossipy reporting about the justices, to just sort of uh, um, align ourselves with that vision and to largely uh, report the, the law instead of the court. And I think, you know, I always use the example just because I think it's interesting when uh, Ginny Thomas called Anita Hill at you know eight in the morning that day uh, they didn't call court reporters to talk about it because they knew that wasn't our story you know they, they knew that was a political story and I think a handful of court, court reporters got called but all the court reporters were like no idea what happened there not interested it's not my beat and when you look at who gets sent to cover confirmation hearings uh, yes, the, the legal reporters are there, but we're there kind of being like, oh, you know, somebody mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Roe v. Wade. Here's the backstory of Roe v. Wade. But what the real, you know, kind of knockout, drag out fight that's happening at that confirmation hearing is being covered by political reporters. And so I think we do collude with the narrative that the court is special and different and that the world understands that we're not in the business of you know, breaking news or spreading gossip or speculating, you know, that's just not our beat.